all systems go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I apologize for the tenor of my voice. I have a cold. It's not COVID, though, so it's all right. Um, I'm so glad that you're all here uh, at Skype a Scientist Live. Today, we are going to be talking about invertebrates, which are my personal favorite uh, group of organisms, even if they encompass about 97% of life, specifically jellyfish, uh, the gelatinous, wonderful beings from the sea and sometimes also freshwater. So uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us to share your knowledge today all about jellyfish. Hi. So yes. Hi, my name is Elizabeth uh, Lee. I am a researcher on jellyfish. It's not always what I've done. So I have been learning about jellyfish. Um, and so I have a couple slides or probably too many slides. Um, so let me let me share my screen uh, here. Doo, doo, doo. And I will do some quick wound healing in jellyfish um, with some of the stuff we give or that we look to study as well as giving you a basis of like, what is a jellyfish? Um, and whoop, there we go. That's what we're going to start with. What What is a jellyfish? Um, because it's a kind of a catch-all term. So here is the life cycle of some jellyfish. Not all jellyfish follow this life cycle, um, but a handful do. And when we talk about jellyfish, we're talking about this medusa stage um, in their life cycle. So this would be an adult stage. Um, and it's free floating, it's in the sea, it makes these nice um, pulsing motions. And so anytime we say jellyfish, that's normally what people are talking about. They're talking about this umbrella structure um, that's very pretty and uh, can sting you. And so that is what I work on. And there are many types of, of jellyfish. I think there's like 300 types. Um, and the idea is is that jellyfish again as this catch-all term so when if you go talk to people who study different species they'll jellyfish isn't specific enough and so you need to know what you're actually asking about um and so what we want to talk about are oh i forgot i tossed this in for fun so this is a comb jelly it's not actually a jellyfish by phylogeny so if you're looking at a tree of life and you look at where all the species are comb jellies while they have jelly in their name and have lots of structures that are kind of similar to jellyfish like being jelly like or gelatinous and have a mesoglea um, they're not actually jellyfish they're their own little branch um, and so right now what you can actually see on these comb jellies are their little cilia and they wave and they get this nice uh, light refracting pattern. It's kind of like if you shine light through a prism, each time they move the little cilia, it's changing how the light refracts and that's why you get that pretty color if you ever see a tinafore. So tinafore is their whole family. And so what we want to talk about actually for a for a quick second is what is a cnidarian? So jellyfish is just a life cycle and then Nidarians is actually the family they're in. And so I'm going to bop through some quick things and then get some wound healing and then we'll just get straight to questions. Does that sound good on the order then? Great. Because uh, otherwise I could tell you all sorts of random facts all day, but I know you'd rather ask questions. So um, just to get us all on the equal playing field, Nidarians, which starts with a C, even though you don't say it. It's my favorite th fun thing I can't spell um, easily. So uh, same with Tinafore. Tinafore also starts with a C. Uh, so cnidarians are invertebrates, so they don't have a spine. And so if you look at these are a image of many invertebrates, none of these things have a actual backbone. They're all pretty squishy. They, if they have some sort of skeleton, it's on the outside like spiders and shrimp. Um, and jellyfish are in here. And then they have stinging cells. This is actually the entire, one of the main features of being a cnidarian is having this type of cell called a cnidocyte, because cyte means cell, and they have a structure in the cnidocyte called a cnidocyst, um, or nematocyst, like a nematocyst, and it will, it's what stings you when you touch a jellyfish. It's mechanically triggered, and when you lightly brush it, it will shoot out this very uh, fast harpoon and sting you. Um, and this is how they catch prey, and or if you step on them. Uh, it's it's just kind of motion censored, so you don't you don't really want to interact with these. But this feature 
um, characterizes all cnidarians. So not only are jellyfish cnidarians, but sea anemones, um, certain corals, anything that has this type of stinging cell, cnidarian. Um, radial symmetry. So you and I, we have bilateral symmetry. You cut us down the center, cut this turtle down the center, we are symmetric. Whereas with a sea anemone or a jellyfish, it ha it's a circle and it's symmetric about it. And then there's no central brain. So we have a central brain. It is typically like here. Other animals have brains that are typically located in their head. The jellyfish doesn't have any sort of central brain location. It is what we call a nerve net. So it's diffused throughout this umbrella and its tentacles. And you, the nerves are connected, but you don't have like a, a central location for a brain. And then, oh, there we go. And then why would we want to use cnidarians to understand wound healing? And how else do we study wound healing? Which we'll, we can talk about, but I don't think I have slides for you on that. So wound healing is an essential process. If we couldn't heal wounds, that would be a bad problem, right? Because if you fell and scraped your knee, you'd have holes all the time. And you don't want holes in yourself because then you let things in. Your skin is your first line of defense from keeping things out um, and keeping yourself in. Both are, both are very important. Um, and so I work on a jellyfish called Clidia hemispherica, and here it is. It's very cute and very small. It is, I was like, here, I brought a slide and see if it works with anything. If not, I have a photo of it in the next one. They're very small. I'd say it's about the size of a nickel when they're full grown. Um, and they have to be that small because otherwise, how do you get them uh, under a microscope? Everyone asks me if I work on a bigger jellyfish, and that would be a pain in the butt. So none of that, it's tiny jellyfish. And here is just a quick schematic of how a jellyfish, some, some, in this specific um, case, how Clidia's body is uh, mapped out. And so there's the X umbrella where there are skin-like cells on top. There is the layer of mesoglia, which is literally the jelly. So when you talk about jellyfishes being kind of gooey or like jelly, that's where the jelly comes from, the squishy layer in the middle. SpongeBob was kind of right. Like there is jelly in the jellyfish, not like, but now not, we're not to the point where you're going to go actually like farm jelly. You don't want to eat it. It's mostly salt water. It's squishy salt water. And then there's the sub umbrella later where there's more um, skin like cells, but they have some special qualities that let them to be able to actually move and pulse. Um, because jellyfish are diploblasts, meaning they only have two layers, unlike us who have three layers. So we have skin and muscle and intestines, gastroderm and endoderm, um, whereas a jellyfish only has ectoderm and endoderm and no actual muscle, but they do still need sort of muscle. So the lower layer acts kind of like muscle. And so when I do my wounding in jellyfish, all I do is I briefly scratch them. Um, I do a surface wound and you can't really actually see it. I should do a better photo for that. But then I mount them and I can watch them heal live. And one of the reasons they're fun to heal live is in this image. So I'm looking at the surface of our jellyfish now. This is on the X umbrella. I've made a little scratch. This is where the scratch is. You can see there's a hole here. This is where the exposed jelly is. And these are their cells. And if we watch them heal, this is sped up a little bit, but in the course of about 17 minutes, this wound is gonna fully heal. And these cells are gonna just crawl and they're crawling towards each other and then they're knitting themselves back up and then they'll relax eventually and there'll be no scar. And so one of the reasons or one of the many reasons that it's exciting to study wound healing in Clidia or in cnidarians in general is that it's very fast. They're very good at it. So if we were to do something like this in us, that would be less, it would be harder to do. We're not transparent. These jellyfish are very nice and transparent. We do not heal as quickly. It's also more complicated in people. We have immune systems. We have cardiovasculature. We have so many other things going on. So if we really want to focus in on just the wound healing part, it's nice to look at something that's evolutionarily a little different and perhaps a little simpler in the mechanism. And so it's this is why I study wound healing and jellyfish. And I think this is where I'm gonna leave it and then let you guys start asking questions. And then if you have things that I already have slides about, I'll switch back to slides. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Boop-a-doo. Stop share, there we go. And then 
questions that we have so far. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So everybody at home, if you or at school for that matter, um, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A um, and then we'll start uh, talking jellyfish. So I have a question yeah. uh, from mm -hmm. my own personal experience as a marine biologist. Sometimes I can just like grab a jellyfish with my paws and nothing feels like it's happening to me. Other mm -hmm. times I know that if I touch a jellyfish, I'm going to be in trouble. What mm -hmm. is what is the difference? Like why can some jellyfish hurt so bad and other jellyfish, it's like nothing? So I don't have a great answer for that because I believe it is a matter of sometimes density of their nidocytes, whether or not they have a ton of them or not. Like they all have them, um, but I actually don't have a great response. In general, my, my, my reaction would be just don't pick up the jellyfish right. with your hands. Um, I understand people go swimming and they wind up uh, getting getting tangled in, having them happen where you have an unfortunate interaction. But I don't actually know why there's a difference. I know some are venomous and then there's problems when you get stung um, that there's like poison in there. So I'm guessing some of it would be due to toxins that exist in these jellyfish. Um, versus ones that are just trying to like mechanically grab you with their little harpoons. So some also might have some chemical warfare, but that would be my best guess at it. But I truly do not know because I'm a new marine biologist. That's fair. That's so fair. also, I guess if you have brain questions, I could answer brain questions because I did that first, but who knows? I was like, we'll check it out. Sounds good. Okay. okay. So we've had a couple questions that have come up around like, how badly can you injure a jellyfish and have it still recover? Like, can great, the, yeah. great question. I love this question. Um, you can do a ton to a jellyfish. It's terrible um, how how or how awful you can be to a jellyfish, and they'll still regenerate. So, in Clidia, I'm gonna actually find you one of my favorite papers because um, it's. It's my favorite figure in this paper. It's a random supplemental paper, uh, supplemental figure in this paper. And basically they wanted to understand how you can, how regenerative is this jellyfish? And so what they did, let me find this figure because it's the greatest. Um, boop, 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 I think we want figure two. Give me like a half second to find it. But basically they went through and they cut a bunch of different patterns into a jellyfish and saw how it healed. So in some jellyfish, in some cnidarians too, you can just chop them up and it's they will fully regenerate into themselves. So there is a, um, a freshwater polyp, a freshwater cnidarian that doesn't have a medusa stage. It's only the polyp. Um, so I, I breezed past very quickly the life stages. So you can have sperm and egg, and then there's a little planula, and then there's a polyp, and then there's sometimes a medusa, and those medusa get released in a couple different ways. But there's a couple cnidarians that are just these polyp stages, and if you chop them in half, they will just fully regrow, and it's amazing. Um, the polyps are a little hardier, I would say, than some of these jellyfish. So clidia, you can chop oop, into many little pieces and you'll get a bunch of smaller jellyfish is what's gonna happen. Um, and because they don't wind up dividing more to give you more cells. Um, and I'm still, I was like, I'm still finding you my favorite figure because it's still very good. Um, where are these supplements? Additional files? Additional files, you guys. Ugh, it's fine. But in general, so if I was to cl cut Clidia in half, I would get just two smaller jellyfish because all it needs to do to wind up healing is it needs to just be able to reseal itself, wound heal basically in a big way, um, and then it will be fine. You can also remove their mouths and their mouths will fully regenerate. So I've done that where you take the jellyfish and you punch out the mouth and then the mouth regrows and it's fine. Also, that mouth by itself will be fine. It will happily continue to eat and seal itself off and be just a weird little floaty mouth for a bit. So, yeah. Awesome. They're very resilient. Yeah. That's impressive. They're very resilient. Um, 
Sounds good. Um, also, side note, when you do find the paper, can you put it in the chat? Yes. One of our people wants to dig in. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, here. I was like, here's the actual paper. And then I'm just trying to, I was just trying to find you the specific figure. But yeah, I have have the paper. I was just trying to like find it at the same time. So the people whose paper this is, there's like three labs that work on this jellyfish. This is one of the, this is the lab that spearheaded it. They are from the south of France um, in ville sur la -Manche. And Clidia comes from... Ville March ah, on the sea, sur la mer. There we go. And these jellyfish are found in the Mediterranean. I should be able to find them in the Atlantic closer on like New England area, and I've not been able to do that, but we don't find ours in the wild. We grow them in lab. We have a jellyfish colony that, so like this guy or lady, because this is actually a lady, I pulled her from our tanks today, and nice. I will probably image her in a little bit after we're done. Cool. But yeah. Wow, fresh yes. jellyfish. Love that. Fresh jellyfish. Um, okay, so we've got a couple people asking, like, do jellyfish have brains? What's the deal with the jellyfish no, brain? No, no, no. They don't so have they really, No, no, so they don't. They have nerves. They have ways to send signals, and it's a neuropeptide-based signaling system, and people have studied it, and electrophysiologically, the nerves function like nerves. There are nerves. There's just no central brain. They didn't evolve to have that. It's all diffuse. So if we were to look at, uh, ba, 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 ba. I was going to pull up some more things. Um, if we look at the brain cells, brain cells, uh, the nerve cells of the jellyfish, what you see is just this this net-like pattern. There's nerves all over, and they commute, and they're synapsed to each other because a synapse is how a nerve connects to another nerve, and they have signaling patterns that people are currently trying to understand. Um, and so there's a preprint of a paper that I can also toss in the chat um, about the nervous system of Clithia. Um, and it's the do, 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 this one that I will toss in. So that's the, nope, that's the RNA seq paper. We want the functional modules one and what's beautiful is people have engineered these jellyfish to be transgenic where they have a way to optically show its signaling um, so they have genetically engineered these jellyfish to uh, have changes in fluorescence when the neurons are firing and they're trying to come up with a model of how these cells interact and how they are actually communicating without having a central nervous system. So this is one way that they're doing it. So the yeah. the parts of the of the net of neurons, like brain cells that are that are not without a brain, uh, that are firing will like light up like little Christmas tree lights as they're. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Um, That's kind of so cool. That I can. I was like that. That is also. Um, where is that? I like how I was like I have all these things and I didn't put them all in one spot like a. Oh, like don't a worry cool about kid. it. Uh, we've got some, um, some, some quick questions yeah. that you can ask while you're beep quick boop questions, sure. Um, Absolutely. How do jellyfish eat and how do jellyfish move? Okay, so in our jellyfish, we have uh, so do, do, let's just actually pop, while I'm while I'm doing this, let me pop this back up because this is I was like this is the very basic way of looking at it. So here's our jellyfish. This is its mouth. Its mouth is also covered in uh, cnidocytes and has all of those nice firing harpoon things. So when shrimp get close to its mouth, so in Clidia, they eat brine shrimp. They eat these very tiny shrimp. They're also known as sea monkeys. Um, so if you ever bought them, that's what they eat. And they will, ha like they consume it and it, it, it moves just because this system doesn't have what we would consider true muscle. They have things that are muscle-like. It just means evolutionarily, we don't call what they have muscle, that they don't have a separate layer for it. So in the sub-umbrella, so the other part I saw was like, how do they even move? Um, is there is these epithelial muscular cells that go all the way around the cell and they look, they look kind of like this. Um, so if we 
look at the lower epithelial structure, the subumbrella. These long ones here, this is just the endogenous GFP of this jellyfish. I haven't labeled anything. Jellyfish have endogenous green fluorescent protein, which is what GFP stands for. Does which endogenous mean? Biologists have endogenous. That was a other good question. Sorry. It just means it has it. So they just have GFP. So people discovered GFP originally in jellyfish. And then biologists and very smart chemists took this protein and were able to use it to put into other systems so that when people talk about, oh, things glowing green, um, they got it from the jellyfish. And there are different types in different jellyfish. Um, and so Clidia has its own GFP. It actually has four types of them. But so this is its own set of GFP and it labels some of the cell outlines. And so it's nice to be able to use it to kind of look at how these cells look. So we're looking at a fluorescence image of the sub umbrella of our, of our jellyfish. And what we can see is these long cells here. So these are what I've been referring to as epithelial muscular cells. They are radially oriented around the jellyfish and they are smooth muscle-like in the sense that they don't have striations or stripes. So for those who have studied muscle before, this is your smooth muscle. This would be like what's in your stomach and intestines. Um, so it can contract, but it doesn't have the striations that your skeletal muscle has. The skeletal muscle of our jellyfish would be this striated muscle net here. So do you guys see where there's kind of gaps in the, in the light here where it looks kind of like a net? So that would be the striated muscle. So that's at the base of the bell of this jellyfish, and that's where it contracts. Um, and it's still, again, not true muscle because jellyfish don't have true muscle. It's just muscle-like. So what is happening is that epithelial cells, or these skin cells of our jellyfish, are specializing in something because there's a need for it. So the jellyfish needs to move, and these cells are specialized in that task. And so that's how it gets this type of motion. Um, and so yeah, that's anytime I think of a jellyfish, it's this motion where it's at the outside. It's not to say that the jellyfish, it can, it can form a taco. It happily does that sometimes where it'll just kind of fold in on itself. It has like weird little maybe cleaning behaviors. Again, hard to claim what a behavior is exactly in something that doesn't exactly have a brain. But um, some people like to claim it's like a cleaning behavior when it folds in, like marginally folds in and is eating something. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. got a number of questions from uh, Miss Goldman's class. Uh, so sure. Oh, yeah. Hi, Ms. Goldman's class yeah. from hey. Rhode Island. That's right. Yes. Hello. All um, five people in Rhode Island. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I always, uh, whenever I think about Rhode Island, I think of uh, the Democratic uh, National Convention when the guys were like, uh, Joe Biden, but also, can we talk about squid? And it was the best. He had like a big thing. Yes. There's a big squish, squid fishery in Rhode Island that cracks me up every time. Anyway, Miss Goldman's class. Um, Excellent. Oh, actually, that question about what do they eat and how do they move, that was from Miss Goldman's class. We just want to make sure. Excellent. There. Um, but here's another one. How long can jellyfish live? It depends on the jellyfish. My jellyfish are in the month-ish, couple month range, normally around month three with us. It, because they're so good at regenerating, even though they're in tanks and they're just lightly circulating, if we take them in and out of tanks, they get nicked and then they heal. But if you nick the wrong spot and you hit some of the stem cells, which means these are your original cells that are going to be able to turn into any other kind of cell, some of these. Um, if you hit the wrong spot and these jellyfish get old, they start growing mouths kind of everywhere, which Whoa. is horrifying. Yeah, no, we've seen jellyfish with like five or six mouths, and then it's like that's not that's no longer what we want to be working with. Um, so Clidia is, I'd say, a couple months. The polyp colonies are kind of immortal. They just are, they're, imagine a little forest of trees that are eating and they're all connected at the base. And so it's all the same animal genetically. And so in a lot of ways you can, I've, I believe I've seen many pop science articles about immortal jellyfish. And so in some sense, the colony itself, kind of immortal. Um, until we possibly kill it because the system breaks or, but if it, we were just, if it was left to just happily eat and spawn, 
could live forever, I'm guessing. Yes, I think the the so-called immortal jellyfish, like that species is called Turritopsis. Uh, yeah. And is the deal with that, that like basically once it's a Medusa or like the thing that looks like a jellyfish that we think of as jellyfish, mm -hmm. it can go backward in development? I no, so some can, um, some, so the one that you're thinking of, it dies, it can sink, and then the cells regenerate. And I don't understand exactly how that works. I mean, I believe them when they, they say that's the sequence of events, that it's dead, but then it creates a new animal from itself. Uh -huh. um, because I could easily see it repurposing itself because they're Nidarians and Nidarians are wild. Yeah. Um, but as many, so in so in some that I guess seems to happen, I think that's a very small subset. Because in a lot of ways, um, for Clidia, for sure, and some other hydrozoans, the jellyfish Medusa stage. So if you think of the polyp colony I talked about as like a forest of trees, um, the Medusa then are flowers. So the polyp colonies are either male or female. They will release male or female jellyfish, which then either release eggs and sperm, which is actually timed by lights. Um, so oh. if they're after a period of dark and then they see light, they will release eggs somewhere between um, an hour or an hour and a half after. And that's how I get to like do all sorts of cool things with their eggs and sperm. Um, sorry for just leaving the share on. Um, so I think of them as flowers. They're pretty ephemeral in my in my eyes. They're short lived because they're supposed to be just these beautiful little flowers that let you spawn new jellyfish because then the eggs and sperm fertilize. They become this small multicellular organism called a planula, which then if it finds the right conditions, plants down and then turns into a new polyp. Um, and then that polyp colony, as long as it's well fed, will start becoming more polyps. And if it's very well fed, it will create the little egg sacs with other jellyfish, which then get released. And so that's how they go on in this sense. And so again, polyp colonies, pretty immortal. The Medusa of some species, not really the most immortal. They can regenerate. Like again, you can cut them up and you get, they're still there, but Relative it depends on the species. Situation. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, it is a species dependent quality. Like Hydra, these freshwater polyps, you chop them in any little bit, you accidentally nick them and you get a little bud, whole new thing, whole new guy right there. They will spawn asexually, so they just bud, and yeah. some will do actual sexual, it's, it's great. They're wow. weirdly prolific. So many, so many approaches to making. So many work. options. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we had, okay, one question, mm -hmm. I forget who asked it. Um, Portuguese okay. manor are, Oh yeah. Are they jellyfish? Are they not jellyfish? What is their deal? So I believe it's like in, in my head from what I've learned, which They're again, um, they are, I was like, they are jellyfish. They're huge. Um, and it's, I was like, it's in my same family as Clidia. So it's like a cousin of Clidia. It's all a hydrozoan. They're all hydrozoans. Um, yeah. So that's, that's definitely a jellyfish and they are, those guys have, those tentacles and stings are rough um so don't add that first don't time. play with them no, um i was like here so wait, let me let me do they're they they're are like very pretty blue and purple and so pretty um but yeah. i got wailed with one of those right across the stomach when i was swimming and here, whoo, here. Whoo, i was like that. i'll just pull them up so that you can see they they are they are very pretty what but that if you see doing. yeah do not do not yeah this bad bad idea don't do that don't do but it. Th like they are very pretty, but don't touch them. In general, as a rule of thumb, don't touch the jellyfish. Yeah. Like have a bucket. Everyone asks me if I've been stung by my jellyfish and I haven't just, I don't pick them up with my hands. I use little little uh, uh, transfer pipettes or little, little dishes. I'm not touching them. I don't need to be stung by my jellyfish. Um, although I do know they can sting because I've watched them sting shrimp in, in my dish. So they're very, I was like, they do want to eat. So for sure, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. We've got a question, two questions yes. from Jenny Barlow. Um, what is the mm -hmm. most favorite part of your job and least favorite part of your job? Oh man, there, it's a, it could be the same thing on different days. Um, I like the variety of what I do. 
and I like getting to teach. I like getting to help mentor people in lab. I think sometimes it is frustrating when things don't work. And that might be, I guess, the worst part. It also could be like the pay. The pay is really sad. Being a postdoc is a, bummer. a sad choice. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's, there's a lot of things that I like about being a researcher and being a postdoc. There's a weird amount of freedom. And it's, it's very frustrating when things don't work or things break and you have to fix it. But it's also kind of very rewarding that a lot of you, you do get to sit down and figure it out and have to figure it out because no one else is going to figure it out. It's, it's your problem. Um, and so to like, I like the variety in my job and that it's interesting and it keeps me entertained and busy um, and curious. And then I really just, I, I dislike the lack of compensation for being so busy. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, and it, it can be a problem having too many things to try and do because then you lose focus and get nothing done. Um, but overall, it's a very, I'm a very privileged person to have this type of job where I have a lot of freedom to think about what I want and how I want to study it and how to build things to do what I want. So the Clidia is not a model system. So I have you guys heard of the term model system before, hopefully. Um, so the idea of a model system is people have picked out a couple species that we have now researched the heck out of so that we have a lot of tools to help. So if you under, like one of the reasons you might see a lot of things where we study stuff in mice is that genetically we've figured out a lot of things about mice and fruit flies. And now there's all of these very useful science tools. So if you've heard about, um, I guess any sort of GFP or it's, it doesn't really matter the names. It's just, there's a lot of tools that already exist to work in these species. On the other hand, that's a, studying like five-ish species to try and assume what we know about or to postulate what we know about everything is not great. And so there are new, newer techniques that exist that allow us to also genetically manipulate these new other organisms to try and study different processes in maybe a more relevant or an easier to see um, organism. And so if you've heard of CRISPR, this is this technique is allowing people to wander about the tree of life and pick different animals and see if we can study things in them. Uh, and so that is part of what's also fun about my job is that I'm in a new model organism, which means there's there's not all of these tools set up. I have to make a lot of these tools or figure out if I can make any of these tools or ask a lot of people if their tools that work in fruit flies might also work in jellyfish if I modify them. Um, yeah. So yeah, I like lots of things. Great. That was good. My I've got some, some rapid fire questions here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rapid fire. Here we go. Here we go. Biggest jellyfish. Yes. What is it? The biggest jellyfish. No, wait, that's, I was like, that's the most venomous jellyfish. The box jellyfish is the most venomous jellyfish. I love, wait, this one, this, these I have answered. I have these answered on slides four things and one of the other questions Fred is monkeys. can a human die from a dog? lion's mane there we go lion's mane very big yes. very big yes or possibly i was like that's the most interesting one but it can be very small and very big and oh gosh i lost the zoom here we go i found my zoom window Hi, it's <laughs> this this guy this guy huge can have h hundreds of feet of tentacles yeah really really, really but it's very cute and can also be very cute and tiny so yes Cool. All right. Um, next, can a human die from a jellyfish sting? I believe you can. I, again, I believe it's the Australian box jelly that you really do not want to ever touch um, because it is truly and utterly venomous and bad. Uh, it looks like this so that you, I guess, don't go up to it anywhere. Uh, but they are, this is the most dangerous one. And that one is, whoop, let me just, yep, we're good. Um, 
because it's it by box it's it's not exactly a box it basically has tentacle bulbs in four places so it's like a box and so its nematocytes have actual poison on their on their darts um, and it's the most venomous marine animal so yeah really? it can have tentacles up to 10 feet long yeah. yes and apparently the body size can reach up to a foot in diameter so oh yay big um, it's That's huge. Good. It can be huge, so don't trouble it. But any box jellyfish, swim yeah. away. Get out of the water. It's not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very, very quick thing. I was like, before you ask another question, I'm going to go quickly show you this, this quick movie. So if I hit play on it, this is what it looks like when nerves are firing. They come in, it seems like. The, the oh. theory they have is that they're in little wedge shapes. Oh. And this is expressing G-CAMP, so it's looking at calcium signaling in these nerves for those, those playing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted you to see that. It's been sped up, but it is pretty beautiful. That is so yeah. cool. All right, we got a question from Trenton. Yes. Trenton Brockman. Sure. Uh, can we eat jellyfish? Oh, absolutely. You can yeah. totally and utterly eat jellyfish. Some people dry them and like you can get nice snacks. You can just eat. You, a lot of people eat like a cold jellyfish salad. Uh -huh. um, that's pretty tasty. I like I was like, I've eaten jellyfish. It's pretty good. You did on top of rice. Um, yeah. Any like anything with enough garlic is probably going to be tasty. <laughs> yeah, I read So I read this book that um, I recommend uh, generally. It's called Spineless. Um, what is the mm. subtitle? Spineless, the science of jellyfish and the art of growing a, a brain, I believe is what it's yes. called. Yes. Uh, a a it's a backbone. Growing a backbone. It's a backbone. Um, I'm going to send you yeah. the Goodreads link right now. It is so good. And it goes into detail about like the ways that people eat jellyfish. And it was oh, excellent. super interesting. Um, one of the parts, basically it almost made it sound like pickle like in consistency. Like they said that you kind of crunch into them because of the way that they're, uh, cooked and preserved. Um, and it really, really made me want to eat a jellyfish because I love pickles so much. Sounds very cool. Okay. Next question. We did. How big can they get? Um, okay. You get stung by a jellyfish. Do you know what to do? Do we put, Oh, honestly, I, I definitely don't know what to do once you get stung by a jellyfish. I, I, again, I am a lab scientist. Yeah. So I have very nice marine biology friends who go out swim in the ocean, collect their species. I should probably learn what to do with a jellyfish sting. I think um, it is vinegar. But I, I'm guessing it's an acid because it would yeah. make most sense with what it should be. But yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Great, everyone, uh, everyone so knows. I, so you I all know what to do. Field with, uh, with places the jellyfish happen to be. And we always carry a bottle mm -hmm. of vinegar with us just in case. Although I think it's, whoops, I, I always accidentally hit the button on my chair and then I just fall to the floor. Um, so, so for some species, vinegar is the right thing. For other species, it's it's like warm or cold water. It, you would think if nidocytes all basically work similarly, there would be one answer, but it's not necessarily true. So it's you know, so again, I like now having th thought about it, it's not about exactly getting harpooned. It's about what's also on the harpoon. Yeah. So it depends on which chemical is on your harpoon, about which chemical you'd want to then use to make it stop working. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I figured nobody needs to see me blow my nose uh, during my sickness. Uh, okay, the next question no is, um, all right, we talked about, oh, how many offspring can a jellyfish have at one time? Oh, so, so the jellyfish aren't having offspring directly. So they are releasing egg and sperm. So in Clidia, so this morning, I had probably 20 jellyfish and I probably got a couple hundred eggs from all of those female. I don't have any idea how many sperm because I don't, count them but they are off fertilizing now if I, I could figure out on the way back but so you can get hundreds of eggs and sperm from them and then each of those has the potential to go and plant down and become a polyp so you could get hundreds and so to possibly answer the question you might actually want when you're looking at um the polyps and where they have their little egg sacs or gonozoids those normally have somewhere between, I'd say, five to seven jellyfish. There are some species of jellyfish, though, in their life cycle, instead of having these little egg sacs, they go straight from this polyp to then releasing to having a little immature jellyfish egg to the medusa. And I believe they wind up doing that 
one at a time. And then again, it also depends on your species. It's really hard to make generalizations about all jellyfish. I think it's one of the reasons why I started off with being like jellyfish can mean a lot of things. And so you have to know which jellyfish you're thinking about to know exactly answers about all of them. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. we got two more questions. Well, we've got a lot more questions, but I think we're going to hit two and then um, wrap up. Okay. So Barrow's STEM Academy wants to know, do jellyfish feel pain or discomfort when you scratch or cut them? <sighs> That's a great question. I don't know. I would assume they feel some because you can anesthetize them, but as a scientist and when you're looking at writing protocols trying you try to minimize pain um but because they're invertebrates they are not as well regulated as ones that have spines so if i was doing this in mice i would have to very much justify how i'm scratching them when i'm scratching them am i doing something to minimize that pain and because this is an in invertebrate there's nothing about it. I do believe they don't like it. If I can anthropomorphize them a little bit, they do retract and cringe. But I don't know if what they're feeling is what we would conceptualize as pain. Sounds good. And um, who eats jellyfish? Yes. Other than us? Wait, oh, who eats jellyfish? Oh, great, 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 great. Here is this great thing about who eats jellyfish. Let me pull that up for you because I have been asked that. Boop. Oh, yes. Boop, ba doo. And I just, I was like, every window is open, just all of them. So it is this one. So let's go, whoop. Yes. So here is this guy. Sea turtles eat jellyfish. Um, and so I'm going to let you see that take a bite out of it. So this is a green sea turtle. Um, and yes, the turtle doesn't care. And it's going to eat it like it's spaghetti, which is pretty cool. <laughs> like um, now, is this video yes. going to show what a sea turtle throat looks like? It is not going to show a sea thro turtle throat. I do we know what you're getting at. show them because yes. it's so we can, wild We can looking. do that. But ooh, I had a bunch of things of what it, so uh, it looks who delicious. else eats them? So penguins eat them. Actually, there was a really nice study where they put GoPros on penguins and saw that penguins ate jellyfish. I will send that study out because that one's actually really fun to read. Um, but basically many things wind up eating jellyfish. Jellyfish will eat other jellyfish. Fish will eat jellyfish. They're just kind of about in the ocean and they're they're prolific and they're a useful source of energy for a lot of species because when you're releasing hundreds of eggs and have the ability to release then potentially then hundreds of jellyfish down the line everything can eat you mola molas which are cool sunfish they're the, about the size of a car door at a, on a good day um yeah so many things eat jellyfish but also us very cool. Ah, uh, yeah. Look at the you. So this is what it looks like when you like look in the mouth of a uh, sea turtle. And the reason what you're looking at here aren't teeth. They're just like protrusions from the throat. And the reason they look so, so scary is because it's to keep the jellyfish down. It's like to keep them moving in that direction. So, uh, you know, it's it's October. It's spooky season. You might as well know what a sea turtle throat looks like. Uh, the more you know. Cool. Okay. So uh, we want to wrap up here. Thank you, everyone. You had so many questions and we really appreciate all your questions. If we didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry. I tried to get to one of everybody, but I know I, I didn't achieve that goal. Um, but we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. The first question is, if you had the attention of everyone in the world and you could tell them one thing about brain slash wound healing slash jellyfish, what would it be? One, one thing, one thing is so rough. Um, huh, I think it's the, the, the importance of having, having wounds heal. You, you have, you have to heal your wounds. Like you have, you have to understand how they're healing. And that's why we want to understand, want to study it because if you don't, that's a big problem. Also, yeah, it seems good. It seems the same cool. 
Sounds good. And then you've got, you still have mm-hmm. to raise attention to the world. You can tell them one thing about anything. It mm-hmm. can be science related. It can be your favorite food related. It can be how, you know, anything, literally anything. Oh no, this is a rough question. Oh, no. It's the hardest one we should have studied. Um, mm. If you're, I was like, if you're not feeling great, you probably should drink a glass of water and it will probably fix most of your problems. I will do that right after this session ends because I'm not feeling great. Uh, cool. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, just drink a glass of water. Can't hurt most of the time. I, I can't think of a situation which would hurt, um, except for something I learned uh, there in middle school, which was very scary. And I won't repeat for the children here even though I was a child when Dare taught it to me. Um, all right, everybody, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Kay, for interpreting for us. Elizabeth, somebody asked in the questions, um, is there anywhere we can follow you on social yeah. media? Are you a social media person? Oh, man, I will I will give you my sad Twitter handle that is Dr. Jelly Biscuits. That's um, <laughs> Because that is that is the one you should follow. Because that is the one where I will post jellyfish things. Um, so let me actually. I was like, I believe it's literally just that. This is. Uh, can I just spell jelly? Can I spell biscuit on the, on the first try? But Dr. Jelly Biscuits, that's me. Beautiful. Take a look. Sounds good. Bye. Um, yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thanks again, Kay. Um, everybody at home, I hope or at school, I hope to see you uh, on November first. We're going to be talking about uh, paleontology with one of like a very engaging, wonderful person, uh, Kirsten Formoso. Um, I will not be the moderator that day um, because regrettably I have to attend a funeral, but the person who's covering for me is energetic, engaging, wonderful uh, Karina Newsom. So you have that to look forward to. Um, I put the link to reserve your spot in the chat. Um, I hope that you will all go and have a wonderful time and ask Karina and Kirsten lots and lots of questions. Um, Have a wonderful rest of the week. We'll see you soon. Bye everyone. Thanks.